تشکر دارم مرحبا هریکا شرینزده اول مک بنیم اچین بیوک بیر زفک و اونور I learned some Turkish in the break, so forgive me, but I'll just do this. Bu etkinlik şimdiye kadar gördüğüm en iyi TEDx etlinkiye. Ali ve ekibini bu harika etlinik için tebrik ederim. It gets better. Çok... Mutluyum ve İstanbul'da bir, bir süre yaşamak, no, yaşamak için gelmeye karar verdim. Uh, so I took the theme of critical crossroads to heart and I actually prepared two talks for this session. And you're going to tell me which one I'm going to give. So this is a very risky experiment. One talk is very intellectual, full of ideas and complex, complex philosophy and abstract notions. The other one is uh, more sensual memories and emotional, more feeling. So hands up all those who want the intellectual talk. Hands up all those who want the one with more feeling and emotion and stories. You're my kind of people. <clears throat> so um, the universe exploded 13.7 billion years ago. It was, I believe, a Wednesday. Now, some of the most significant things in my life have happened on Wednesdays. In fact, I've made key decisions, personal and professional, on Wednesdays. And in fact, I'm going to be in Istanbul until next Wednesday. So I'm going to tell you a handful of stories, some of which are true, now, the rest are the fruits of the fertile imagination of an Iranian filmmaker stuck between two worlds, England and Iran, and torn between his head and his heart. Now, we're going to talk about the um, origins of creative inspiration and um, critical decision making uh, and the inner working of making a film, a journey that's brought me to the point at which I'm going to make the most important film in my life. But before we start, Let's kick off with a film I made a few years ago, 15 years ago, about a woman and her love for her typewriter. When I was a little girl, I really wanted a typewriter. And my father bought me one. So why would you want a typewriter at that age? Well, I couldn't play the piano. I couldn't learn. I wouldn't be bothered to learn, but I did want, I did, I did want to type. And um, I just did. I wanted a typewriter. Now, I bet we all have piano typewriter. <laughs> I bet we all have piano typewriter stories lurking in our childhood. Uh, I'm going to tell you about mine. I grew up in pre-revolution Iran under the rule of the Shah. I went to a school where quite a few of the teachers were political activists, frequently arrested by the secret police, the Savak. For a bunch of kids, we were quite politically savvy and well informed. Uh, books banned by the government uh, would be smuggled in and passed under desks in the class, and you take them home one by one, looking around nervously in case somebody was following you. Um, it was a life lived in fear, well, a little bit of fear, but quite exciting for a 12-year-old boy. Uh, we were future revolutionaries destined for 1979. But I was never part of the inner circle, always the outsider, because I'd found another love, cinema, and television. 
This was the um, early 70s, and I was hooked on American imports, like Star Trek, Mission Impossible, Colombo, all beautifully dubbed in Persian. Now, we had the Klingons and Mr. Spock, fluent in Persian. Captain Kirk would deliver those end-of-episode homilies in words used by Rumi and Omar Khayyam. Now, I have to mention them because I'm Iranian, and you know, we have poetry in our soul fed to us with our mother's milk. Now, in the summer, I would sleep in the garden under cherry trees, drunken jasmine wafting in the air, gazing at the stars in the Milky Way. But I would also eavesdrop on conversations between the adults late into the night. And they would be talking about Iran and its troubled past. And every now and then, they would whisper a word, whisper it. Musaddeq. No. Musaddeq. Now, I had no idea what or who or whatever Mossadegh was, but the word stuck in my memory, just went deep into my psyche. Now, all of this came to an end when in 1975 I was sent to England to school, and suddenly, at a young age, uh, a whole new language, a new culture, a new people, a new tribe to observe the British, all from the outsider's perspective. Now, at school I was good at sciences and ended up doing physics at Nottingham University, where uh, I took an option in astrophysics, and in my final year for the graduation project, I persuaded the physics department to let me make a film instead of doing an experiment. So we ended up making a film about black holes. I got together with some friends, we converted their attic into a spaceship, they built me a model, and uh, I, couldn't, I didn't have the George Lucas budget, so I zoomed in and out of the spaceship model, suspended with fish, fishing line from the ceiling, to make the creation, create the sense of movement against the black velvet. Now, I'm gonna show you something which has never been seen in public. This is my first film. Uh, a few things to look out for. Uh, one is I take myself very, very seriously in this film, embarrassingly seriously. We use a, a, a, an air freshener as a warp speed dial, and, and I press far too many buttons, way far too many buttons, which are actually upside down plastic pots of jam with sticky labels on them. Air freshener. Just more buttons, just to be sure. There are many strange and interesting ideas associated with black holes. For instance, black holes serving as time machines, carrying us to the remote past or the distant future. Or gravity tunnels providing interstellar or intergalactic subways that would enable us to travel to inaccessible places much more rapidly than we could in the ordinary way. Or how about this? A black hole the size of the nucleus of an atom solving all our energy problems. Now, that was the best physics project ever in my life. Um, it did two things. Um, it got me a degree in physics and a place at film school. Now, at film school, I learned a lot of things. But I learned this more than anything else. You have to copy. You have to steal. And at film school, when I graduated, I stole from one of my heroes, Woody Allen. I uh, had seen Manhattan. I was madly in love with Manhattan. And I tried to make a very, very cheap Manhattan. It was so cheap, I didn't have money for sound. So it's a silent, black and white romantic comedy. This is the original, Woody Allen's Manhattan in 1979. I made a black and white romantic comedy called Mechanics of Love. It's only 11 minutes, and this is my version. And the Clifton Suspension Bridge in Bristol stands in from the Queensborough Bridge in Manhattan. Now, this got me uh, my first job in television and led to my first documentary as a director. And this film was, in fact, a combination of my film, film school background and my physics background. It's a documentary about amateur astronomers, charming, eccentric English people whose feet are firmly on the ground, but their hearts are in stars. Let's get it aligned properly now with these aluminium pegs. Well, we're interested in the fact that we're his parents, and so we're interested in what he's interested mm. in. 
But apart from that, it's a very cold occupation. Mm. I mean, it's, it's usually <laughs> cold when it takes place, you see. And... Uh, it has to be a clear night, night so if it's a clear night... and it can start at 10 o'clock and go on until 3 or 4 in the morning. When we think, what is he still stuck out there? <laughs> Wait a bit. It's fascination of looking upon other worlds. I enjoy all of the planets. They're like individuals, really. There's different things going for each one. With Jupiter, you've got the wealth of detail in the belts and zones, the fact that there's something always happening there. Mars, you've got your seasonal differences. Polar caps, dark markings, you see it rotating. Venus, you've got the phases similar with Mercury and with Saturn, you've got that splendid set of rings. Fantastic. So this kicked off my directing career. I ended up spending the 90s making some 20 films about the English and their charming eccentric ways. This is a film about uh, a car park attendant who during the day is a car park attendant and at night he's an exorcist or a spirit medium. Uh, this one is about Britain's only black ventriloquist who, who had two dummies, one black and one white, and on stage the, the black and white dummy would argue. And, uh, and this one is a film about allotments, uh, uh, community gardens in inner cities. So there is this Iranian filmmaker lurking in the back gardens of the British psyche, looking, I'm not quite sure for what. Uh, so how do I work? Um, when I start a film, I don't have a plan. I deliberately don't have a plan. I make no decisions. I tend to not overdo the research. I don't make a lot of notes. Uh, I don't structure. There's no script. But there is one thing I do know for sure at the beginning of every film. I know how you're going to feel at the end of the film when the lights come up. I know the emotional arc. So. A magazine once asked me, uh, do you feel more British or more Iranian having lived in the UK for so long? And I said that uh, actually my head is British, but my heart is Iranian, and I would not have them the other way around. Um, what I to say on TED is that actually it's a bad thing to say at TED. It's a blasphemy to say this at TED. I am not an ideas man. Uh, I feel my way through human stories that lead me to ideas. And so, where does that go, has that got me? After the 90s, I got done with looking at the British and their charming, eccentric ways at home. I was much more interested in what they were doing abroad. I was actually more interested in films of substance and impact and more personal and something, something to say. So, when in 2001, after 9-11, uh, George Bush and Tony Blair invaded Afghanistan to smoke out one man and his gang, I was interested in what the ordinary Afghans were feeling about foreign armies on the land again. So in November 2001, I went to a refugee camp controlled by the Taliban near the Iranian border in Afghanistan to meet them and find out. So, um, I could actually reach out and touch Iran from across the border when I was making that film. So it was, a matter, it was only a matter of time before I went back home to make my very first film in Iran. And so in 2004, I got a commission from PBS in America to make a film, and I chose the subject of a reformist newspaper called Shar. Shar means East. So I came from West and went all the way East to make a film about young journalists at a reformist newspaper. And uh, the scene coming up was shot in the summer of 2004, and Saddam Hussein had just gone on trial in Baghdad, and amongst his crimes was gassing the Kurds and uh, Iranian soldiers during the Iran-Iraq war. And so, Striving for human stories behind the headlines, Sharg sends a reporter and photographer to visit veterans exposed to chemical weapons, but whose symptoms are only showing now. Uh, 
بوست چی رو وقتی که بالا میشته مشخص رو گاز و خردل شما بالا گاز و خردل چی This veteran had to have his right leg amputated just three weeks ago. برای اینا اون گروهی هستن که درسته تعدادشون کمه به نسبت کل جمعیت ولی واقعا زندگیشون رو دست داره یا خانواده متلاشی شده یا اسمن فقط یه مردی توی خونه هست زن خونه اصلا حرمتی برای اون خونه وجود نداره با آدم این چیزها رو که میبینه So that's a far cry from the uh, charming, cozy world of English eccentrics. Uh, so what am I doing now? Well, I'm going to be telling the story of this man, Dr. Mohammad Mossadegh. He was Iran's first democratically elected prime minister. And uh, Time magazine named him Man of the Year in 1951 because he nationalized Iranian oil and really, really irritated Churchill. Um, because the Iranians are not supposed to control their oil, uh, which was controlled at the time by the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company, which we now know better as uh, British Petroleum. So in uh, August 1953, this year is the 60th anniversary, uh, the CIA and MI6 or orchestrated a coup and toppled Mossadegh and reinstalled the Shah to do their bidding for them. Mossadegh was then put on trial for treason and put in jail for three years, after which he was put under house arrest where he actually died, a sick old man, in 1967. Mossadegh was potentially Iran's Mahatma Gandhi. He was potentially the father of a future democratic Iran, an Iran in which a young 12-year-old boy wouldn't have had his teachers arrested or be scared of reading a book. Now, a lot of people, possibly including you, wouldn't know much about Mossadegh. But by the time I finish making my film about him, his life, and the coup, you will. I don't know how the film is going to be made, how it's going to be structured, but it's beginning to happen. But I know one thing for sure. I know how you're going to feel, how I'm going to feel, and how Iranians are going to feel when the lights come up. And that's the title of the film. And Tashakur Daram. I'm, I'm so happy I invited you over. Thank you. Because you... I apologize for my Turkish at the beginning. It's very rusty. Uh, you should try me in, in Persian. You oh, know, we should. <laughs> okay. Muhteşem bir adam, değil mi? Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, thank you very much.